an island in the Caribbean. A coded rhythm is a call to arms. The tables are about to turn on slavery. Winner take all. The revolution in St. John comes before two of the greatest revolutions in the world, the American Revolution and the French Revolution. In a single night, decades of suffering are avenged. We wanted freedom. We were going to get it one way or the other. The rebel strategy hinges on a weakness festering within the enemy stronghold. <laughs> if there was one moment in the history of St. John, it was that moment when that fort was taken. In one coordinated attack, African slaves get a foothold on freedom in the New World. These men and women um, lit a spark that caught fire throughout this Caribbean. But the motives of their leaders are anything but straightforward. Whoever was not with them were to be enslaved under them. Emerging from the ashes of a slave revolt is a new view of human bondage and its stranglehold on humanity in the 18th century. In a world consumed by slavery, no one is free and few are innocent. The island of St. John sparkles in the Caribbean sun like a jewel set in blue crystal. Seven miles long and three miles wide, it's part of the Virgin Island chain, a necklace of eight main islands and 75 islets. A U.S. territory since 1917, three-fifths of the island is a national park. St. John's idyllic coves are havens for the well-heeled and world-weary. But underneath the plush towels and designer beach bags, this is a paradise with a past. Oh, no. Oh, no. Flashback to 1733. St. John is rocked by a slave revolt. Leading the rebels are members of African royalty, sold into slavery as well. Among them, two chieftains. Danish records identify them only as King June and Prince Akashi. Their campaign is so effective, armed forces from three colonial powers are called in for support. St. John had become the first black state in the Americas. It was indeed the first black revolution to occur in America. Today, the embers of rebellion still smolder and glow in the folkways of the island. Like many natives of St. John, Professor Gilbert Sproul first heard of the revolt from island storytellers. The story they told was that um, at a particular time of the year, the water would turn red, which came from the blood of the slaves. The saga of St. John's slave revolt lives in a no-man's land, somewhere between legend and fact. It's in the folklore, it's in the oral history, it's in the tradition of the island. But the question is, how does this show up on the landscape? At a site called Cinnamon Bay, a solid link to a complex struggle has been found. Assisted by local volunteers, archaeologists Douglas Armstrong, Mark Hauser, and Ken Wilde uncover the remains of a possible 1733 slave residence. A time war back to a rumble that shook the Caribbean. A mystery specific to the Cinnamon Bay site has put the team on overtime. Traces of carbon indicate the building that once stood here may have been the target of arsonists. But who were they? This is where 
the historian that works in the documentation now needs to, to interact and work with the archaeologist who can actually look into the ground and confirm the written record. And when we can mingle those two, we've got it now. This site is no accidental discovery. Archaeologists were guided here by an excavation of another sort. Historian David Knight dug through recently compiled collections of 18th century Danish tax records. Merging the records to the lay of the land, David helped expose a site literally vanished beneath the sands of time. I realized that you could actually take documentation uh, from the archives and bring these sites and people to life. From sites like these, Knight hopes to piece together a conflict that has fascinated him since childhood. The story of the 1733 uprising on St. John has all the elements of, of great fiction, but indeed it is history. It's really a very exciting time to be a historian. Danish archives give clues to the European perspective. The worldview of their slaves can be read on the ruins of a plantation called Annaberg. What these Africans scratched out on this dungeon wall speaks volumes. We can feel the need of an imprisoned slave looking out the window at the planter's grand home, watching the trade going on in the harbor, and needing to tell us a story. And in creating these images, he has left a legacy that is both poignant and significantly empowering. The drawings depict plantation manors and a harbor filled with colonial ships, a world order the rebels hoped to overthrow in 1733. But how did the rebels coordinate their attacks? Oh, no! What were the goals of its leaders? And out of St. John's slave population, how many actually took up arms? The countdown to revolution began with a growth industry, a global craving that consumes the island. In 1733, sugarcane is the number one cash crop in the Caribbean. Why, you ask? Well, for one thing, sugarcane is the main ingredient of molasses, a whole new taste experience for Europeans. Sugarcane is also fermented to produce rum. Liquid sunshine from the Caribbean takes the continent by storm, and the Danish are more than happy to supply the demand. The Danish go into cane production big time. At the top of the food chain is Governor Gardelin, a penny pincher and former accountant for the Danish West Indies Company. Next on the pecking order are well-heeled plantation owners, like Gardelin's son-in-law, Johannes Sattner. Further downstream, your average Danish settler, average being a relative term. Some are banished here for bad debts. Others are little more than retired thugs and killers. Many of them probably have pasts, have been pirates in the past, and uh, uh, maybe have run afoul of the law in other places. Their new gig is to turn a paradise into a production line. Sugarcane plantations are carved out of the wilderness by a captive workforce. Motivation at the work site is provided by men known as Bamba, head slaves with an attitude. They work for men like Satan, masters with hearts as hard and brittle as sugar cubes, according to this 18th century account. Insensible to the sufferings of slaves, they think and dream of nothing but sugar. Sugar, to which, in consequence, every spot of land is condemned. To keep production moving smoothly, St. John's planters gather at a marketplace on the nearby island of St. Thomas. Under a sweltering sun, they come here to buy flesh and blood. Hey, Peter, here have two fools, slaves, and two fools, two drinks, and chicken up. An eyewitness describes the dehumanizing process of slave inspection. They look in their mouths to see if they have all their teeth and to see if their tongue is red and healthy. They then examine their legs, thighs, and arms to make sure they are not swollen. 
After inspecting the goods, the bidding begins. On the high end, the price of a grown male can fetch the equivalent of $2,000 today. Boys, half the price. Planters can even bid on the unborn infants in a mother's womb. The fear and humiliation suffered by the slaves is followed by incredible pain. Professor Sandra Green from Cornell University studies the business end of slavery at historic Fort Frederick on the island of St. Croix. This is the kind of branding iron that was used widely during the era of the slave trade. It indicates who was purchasing the slaves so that when they were actually sold in the West Indies, they would know where the money would go to, whether it would be to a company or whether to a specific individual. White hot branding irons are pressed into thighs or shoulders. It's nothing personal, just business as usual. Slavery existed all over the world. It was well known. It was never seriously questioned until much more recently. It was simply part of the fabric of life. In 1733, the slave market receives royal visitors from across the sea. Their names, King June and Prince Akashi, leaders of an African tribe known as the Akwamu. Before the year is out, they will help lead the slave revolt. But until they arrived here in chains, tearing down the establishment was the last thing on their minds. That's because the Aquamu were the establishment, at least on the African side of the Atlantic. The Lower Gold Coast, a key supply hub for slavers and the home turf of the Aquamu tribe. Trade in human beings will drain Africa of roughly 20 million men, women, and children over the span of 200 years. Called black gold, slaves are the world's most valuable economic resource. African chieftains are not blind to the profits that Europe is raking in from their shores. Soon the Aquamu nation muscles its way into the business. By 1710, they represent a corner of an infamous global triad. The slave trade that connected Africa, the Americas, and Europe is generally known as the triangular trade. Starting from Africa, you have a variety of commodities like cloth, metalware, firearms, ammunition being traded for human beings. Aquamu leaders like King June and Prince Akashi grab a big piece of the action. Warriors as well as businessmen, they conquer and pillage the neighboring kingdoms. Trading humans for guns is a popular form of exchange, but not the only one. The Danish also buy slaves with cash. And where do they get the money? Well, they make it from selling their Caribbean rum in Europe. In other words, and here's the sick twist, the slaves working the sugarcane fields of St. John are indirectly creating the cash base to enslave their own people in Africa. A popular Aquamu proverb is Sika ne ohene, money is king. The Aquamu turn the proverb into a battle cry. If communities did not pay their taxes as demanded by the Aquamu state, they would be subject to military invasion and conquest. People would be captured. Many of the men would be executed, but some would also be sold into the slave trade. But King June and Prince Akashi are about to suffer a major role reversal. Defeated by a rival tribe, the Aquamu will be sold as slaves to the Danish. Soon, King June and Prince Akashi will follow their victims on a voyage through hell. Historians call it the Middle Passage, a serene phrase for a deadly crossing. More to the point is this contemporary account. Were the Atlantic Ocean dried up today, one could trace the pathway between the slave coast of Africa and America by a scattered roadway of human bones. Death haunts the slaves from the moment they are bound together for shipment. These are the kinds of shackles that were used in Africa. This ring was placed around the neck and locked. It is heavy. 
It's abrasive, it can cut the skin. The chain would make sure that one could not break away from the other. Over the span of 200 years, 20 million Africans cram the holds of slave ships. Life on the slave ship must have been hell. Hot, humid, people were sick, they had dysentery. Shipborne diseases claim 10 million dead. You have schools of sharks that regularly followed these slave ships because they knew that in fact they would get uh, these bodies thrown overboard on a fairly regular basis. After months at sea, the survivors are auctioned off like pack animals on St. John's neighboring island, St. Thomas. Among them now, the Aquamu leaders, King Jun and Prince Akashi. After years as slave producers, they now stand before Danish consumers as products on the shelf. But it won't take long for the Aquamu to realize that slaves hold the majority on the Virgin Islands. Africans outnumber the Europeans five to one. St. John was in desperate need of labor. By 1733, most of the Danish properties on the island were still in the process of converting their land to agriculture. There was no colonial plantation infrastructure established here. And it's during that period that, of course, the most backbreaking labor had to be performed by the slaves. On the other hand, being outnumbered by people you work to death can keep you up at night. A slave owner from St. Thomas put it this way. If one has a slave, how much more of a slave is he than the one he purchased? One has to sleep always with the fear that domestic enemies will slit one's throat at night to end our days. In May of 1733, Prince Akashi and King Jun are sold into hard labor on the adjacent island of St. John. Fresh water here is scarce, rainfall infrequent, and to save money, plantation owners force the slaves to grow their own food or starve. They're also clearing virgin forest for agriculture. They're cutting off the trees. They're removing the big stones from the land. It was a real effort just to stay alive. A sympathetic eyewitness wrote this account of life under the wind. One can only have deep pity for the miserable victim of a cruel owner, and there are many such owners. I saw one poor slave tied to a pole and whipped until it seems that his flesh was coming apart. When slaves are not clearing land, they're harvesting sugarcane and processing the juice for molasses and rum. David Knight visits a site where physical exhaustion and physical risk were literally rolled into one. What we have here are the cane crushing rollers uh, that extracted the juice. The rollers are pulling the cane in. And of course, in the early period, many arms were lost when a laborer would be feeding the cane into the machine and his arm would be drawn into it. For that purpose, an ax was always kept next to the cane crushing machinery so that the arm could be cut off before the individual was completely sucked into the machinery and killed. When the slaves are not squeezing juice from sugar cane, they're enduring 13-hour days cutting more cane down in the fields. To make their situation worse, if that's possible, King June and Prince Akwashi suffered through two hurricanes, a locust plague, and a drought in their first summer. By the fall of 1733, the slaves are literally starving. Some will choose suicide over death from starvation and physical punishment. But others, including the Aquamu, endure the worst the planters can dish out. At the other end of the whip are men blinded by racism, unable to recognize the intelligence of those they enslave. The Aquamu leaders begin to plan a coordinated campaign of revolution. 
Meanwhile, others take more immediate action. Their only weapon, a lethal knowledge of nature. The slaves recognize on St. John many of the same plants and herbs that grow in Africa. I should be uh, scanning and looking for uh, medicinal plant remains from Africa. Okay, nice Ken Wilde and Doug Armstrong find traces of local herbs in the ruins of Cinnamon Bay. The evidence supports historical accounts that colonists have begun to rely upon African herbal cures to survive the tropics. But according to Danish records, being at one with nature could prove hazardous to your health. Get on the wrong side of your cook, and you might want to think twice about diving into that turtle soup. By 1733, poisoning is a leading cause of death on St. John. For the victims, it's hard to see it coming. The effects of poisons made from the island's plants create symptoms that resemble those of tropical diseases that run rampant in the Caribbean. Père Labat, a French priest, writes this report. The secret and insidious manner in which the crime is generally perpetrated make legal proof of it extremely difficult. Suspicions have been frequent, but their detections are rare. While some Africans get even through stealth, others take their chances in the wilderness. Field slaves give the plantations the slip and escape into St. John's steep jungle hills. By the fall of 1733, something almost unimaginable takes place. Free from colonial restrictions, an African community thrives in the backwoods of St. John. Outnumbered five to one, the planters are surrounded by a renegade society. They feel that these individuals are plotting against them and that other laborers that are still on the estates are going up and meeting with these runaways at night to help plan something. The colonists feel overwhelmed. So now what? You're outnumbered on an isolated island surrounded by people who hate your guts. You could try negotiating, but no, the Danes just don't get the picture. Governor Gardelin puts a brutal new slave code into effect to scare the Africans into submission. 19 cold-blooded paragraphs give plantation owners free reign to inflict inhuman punishments on their field hands and servants. A slave who attempts to poison his master shall be pinched three times with red-hot pinches and then broken on a wheel. Any slave, knowing of the intention of others to run away, shall be burned on the forehead and receive 100 lashes. Each runaway slave shall lose one leg, or if the owner pardons him, shall lose one ear and receive 150 lashes. A slave who lifts a hand to strike a white person or threatens him with violence shall be hanged. Should the white person demand it, if pardoned, he shall lose his right hand. While Gardland and the Planter Society at large clearly saw this code of laws as a deterrent, history proved that it had exactly the opposite effect. Defiant slaves ignore Gardelin's threats. Many risk torture or death and flee to camps in the jungle. By the fall of 1733, the island falls into a state of anarchy. There was clearly a lot of tension. Everyone was aware that something was going to happen. They just didn't know when. Along with other aqua moves, King Jun and Prince Akashi seize the day. Armed with makeshift weapons and a handful of stolen guns, they plan their revolution. Incredibly, in the new social order they envision, slavery will have its place. The concept of slavery is so ingrained in the 18th century mindset 
the practice of owning human beings is accepted by both master and slave. It was a well-known, unquestioned institution. It was all over the continent. North Africa, West Africa, East Africa. You had slavery in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, slavery in Europe as well. It was simply part of the fabric of life. People uh, became enslaved. They had a certain life. People tried to gain their freedom. People got their freedom. Other people were enslaved. It was simply part of the way in which uh, society operated. The African leaders of St. John's uprising opt to maintain the status quo. Slavery will continue. Only the masters will change. The plan and what occurred was that the leaders of the event intended to take over the island and run it for themselves. And whoever was not with them were to be enslaved under them. King Jun and Prince Akashi now escaped themselves, moved from camp to camp, organizing a revolt. Marjo. To concentrate their power, they deal only with their own people, the Aquamu. Their goal, to rebuild their kingdom, not in Africa, but on the fringe of the new world. you But how will they coordinate the revolt? How can they get word both to the slaves still on the plantations, as well as to those in remote jungle camps? The answer is a code and a broadcast device as old as the hills of Africa. Embedded like a blueprint in the minds of St. John's African slaves is the ancient art of drum making and using specific rhythms to send the latest news. Eddie Bruce is a master drummer and a leading expert on traditional African drumming. Talking drums are drums that are used to communicate messages over distances, uh, small and great. They can be used to demonstrate or call people to different types of social functions like weddings, funerals, baby birth, name ceremonies, war. It's very likely that drum language was used as a way to organize their supply lines, how to scout out their enemies, how to overcome them. That's a basic call to arms, a very basic. As the drums spread the word, King Jun and Prince Akashi finalized their strategy. Their game plan is ambitious. After conquering St. John, they'll take the neighboring islands of Tortola and St. Thomas as well. All that stands in the rebels' way is St. John's poor excuse for a military post, manned by down-and-out Danish grunts. Many of the lads are exiled here for bad behavior or worse. Former Governor Eric Bredal put it this way. They are indeed so wretched, they cannot be trusted, no longer at their posts. They get so drunk that they fall off the walls where they stand on duty, some falling to their death. In fact, Danish party animals were so out of it, they didn't bother to hide the evidence. Right here, we find the base of an early 18th century utilitarian liquor bottle known as an onion bottle. And then perhaps most common amongst all the material remains up here would be uh, pipe stems. Pipe smoking would have been something that all the soldiers did as part of their pastime, keep them awake at night up on the parapet while they stood watch. As the military self-medicates, the rebels plan to take them out of their misery. of November 23rd. Prince Akashi and King June select two targets. The first is plantation owner Johannes Sattler. Some believe the slaves knew he was close to the governor and savagely attacked in revenge for Gardaland's brutal slave code.
as the whip changes hands, the brutality of the master now becomes that of the slave. Meanwhile, a few miles away, a group of slaves arrive at the fort with a routine delivery of firewood. Hidden in the bundles are razor-sharp knives. Archaeologists find several of these tools at the Cinnamon Bay site. This is the cane knife found just off the shore in Cinnamon Bay. A cane knife like this, of course, was used for cutting cane. Uh, it was used by almost every slave on the island, uh, so it was in everybody's possession. Now the cane knife serves a new and sinister purpose. Satna, a close associate of the governor, is murdered. At the nearby fort, rebel insurgents overcome the guards. The Aquamoos overrun the Danish troops. Guns and ammunition are looted from a supply room. If there was one moment of individual nationalism that ever occurred in the history of St. John, it was that moment when that fort was taken. Only one Dane escapes the fort alive. As he runs for his life, the rebels ascend to the parapets above. Here, King June uses a Danish cannon to send a mixed signal. That's a blank. So why fire the big gun? Well, two reasons. First, it's a prearranged signal to other rebel groups that the revolt is a go. Now, secondly, the rebels know the Danish use a cannon blast to summon the planters to the fort in emergencies. But this time, when the planters show up, they walk straight into a rebel ambush. With arms captured from the fort, the Aquamoos split into two units. The first group will hold the fort and the surrounding plantations at Coral Bay. A second unit will travel along the North Shore to attack the remaining settlements there. What they're doing is they're making flanking maneuvers on either side in hopes to converge at the center to uh, entrap people. There's uh, clear evidence of a knowledge of systematic warfare. African women help swell the ranks. Experts suspect at least one female rebel is motivated by ties of blood and love. Her name is Brefu. On the afternoon of the revolt, she joins a raiding party headed here to Brown Bay. Brown Bay was the site of the two neighboring plantations owned by Peter Croyer and Pierre Castan. It was here that as the uprising spread from Coral Bay into the countryside, that the planters at Brown Bay were amongst the first to feel the brunt of the rebels' resolve. The plantation is the scene of a bloodbath. Killed is a colonist named Croyer, his wife and children. Some historians write the incident off as random violence, but David Knight sees another possible scenario. Intriguingly, the documentary record may give us a clue as to why the Croyer family were singled out and murdered here on this spot. They were not able to afford full-grown, healthy adult slaves, so they had purchased two children. While the deaths are brutal, the motive is universal. It's quite possible that as the rebellion spread to this area, the Croyers were singled out in an effort to save those children. The Croyer murders rattle Governor Gardelin. He's also surprised to learn that Brefou is not a man, but a woman. Gardelin orders St. John's militia to track down the raiders, but he's too late. By sunset on November 23rd, the rebels gain control of St. John's East End. Over two centuries later, 
A breakthrough of another sort is won by archaeologists at Cinnamon Bay. Artifacts from the site indicate the ruins were indeed a shelter for slaves. Cowrie shells like this um, were part of um, currency in West Africa. They were used in clothing and fasteners and adornment. Uh, finding a, a piece like this on this site uh, gives a suggestion of people bringing items from Africa into the Caribbean, into a site, into a site uh, of Slave House. Along with the artifacts, another discovery allows the team to fix the date of the ruins, firmly in the timeline of Caribbean history. Armstrong and company discover a layer of ash covering a floor of mortar, evidence that the structure burned to the ground. Okay, I think we're ready for the sample. Let's go straight to the bag. Samples will be sent off for carbon dating in hopes of confirming the slave house was destroyed during the revolt. In fact, the ash reveals a burn layer, dated directly from the year 1733. The pattern of charred evidence indicates the compound was deliberately burned. But who had the motivation? Now, according to Danish records, some houses are torched by the colonists to keep their property and goods from falling into rebel hands. But at Cinnamon Bay, the team has second thoughts about this burn-it-yourself scenario. This time, the evidence doesn't come from the ground. It comes instead from the hands of the Danes themselves. Sorting through collections of Danish records, David Knight finds a plausible scenario. According to an 18th century report, the Cinnamon Bay compound was attacked and torched by the rebels, not the colonists. But why would the rebels destroy a house that they themselves could occupy? The answer reveals a new shade to what once seemed a black against white revolution. Not all the slaves are buying into the rebel program, including the crew at Cinnamon Bay. As St. John's slave revolt intensifies, some colonists are warned of rebel attacks by their own slaves. They're coming. There very well may have been many slaves on St. John who were enslaved themselves by the Aquamu, and that in itself may have prevented them from wanting to support the Aquamu in this rebellion. Some colonists escaped to a deserted island, assisted by their field hands. Many slaves actually stay behind to defend the plantation. Their motive? Most likely a combination of loyalty and practical self-interest. They did have an investment. Um, they did have a stake. They did have some kind of sense that um, this was um, their land, their house. In fact, even perhaps personal relationships with the managers and owners. In fact, ongoing research reveals that St. John's slave revolt was waged by a relatively small group of determined individuals. Of the 1,200 enslaved laborers that were on St. John, we only have implicated around 120, 140 individuals. We're talking about 10% of the slave population on the island at the time. Loyal slaves must ultimately run for their lives as rebel attacks intensify. At the time of the rebellion, this group of people um, chose not to join the rebellion. They resisted the rebellion, and ultimately the house was burned. After looting the house of food, the rebels burn it to the ground, a scene repeated across the island, according to this account. This resistance is a major setback for the rebels. They have no choice but to fight the other slaves and cripple them by setting their plantations aflame. Africans against Europeans, slaves against rebels, and soon, another iron. News of the revolt finally reaches the governor's office on the nearby island of St. Thomas. The lone survivor of St. John's garrison reports the fort has been wiped out.
With only a handful of Danish troops to spare, Gardelin beefs up their ranks with a group of specialists. For them, the color of your skin comes in a poor second to the color of your money. They served as a first line of defense for the government, and they were rewarded with property, confiscated plantations. Called the Free Negro Corps, they consist of freed slaves. Soon, they sail for St. John. Their mission, to hunt down the African rebels. On St. John, the Aquamu rebels mass their forces for their biggest assault on the planters yet. We can see that the colonists feel powerless to control the situation. And at the same time, with the spark of the revolt, is empowering to the Africans. The colonists send their families off the island. The remaining men hole up at a plantation owned by Peter Durlu. There was a whole night of very tense waiting, not knowing really what had transpired in the night, how many more rebels had joined, and what the attack would be like. What we're looking at is a, a battlefield at this position, at this point. At 3 p.m., the rebels strike. rebels find themselves outgunned. The Aquamu leaders may have underestimated the firepower of the enemy. By the time a retreat is called, the rebels have spent nearly all of their ammunition. They withdraw to their jungle strongholds to regroup. The Durlu plantation site represents the only true battlefield in this whole confrontation. By this point in the revolt, the uprising had really become a military struggle between two warring nations, an African nation and a European nation being fought on foreign soil. The rebels rely on a guerrilla war to keep the planters on the defensive. During the winter months, the Africans remain in control, something very new in a brave new world. St. John had become the first black state in the Americas. It was indeed the first black revolution to occur in America. When the planters on St. John threatened to throw in the sponge, Danish governor Gardelin is desperate. On March 21st, he begs the French government of Martinique for a bailout. I feel that we are on the verge of something terrible happening. Unless you have the kindness to honor me with your assistance, you cannot allow slaves to triumph over our weaknesses and to render us victims to their rebellion. April 1734. The French commander Longueville lands on St. John with a contingent of the Free Negro Corps. Known for his harsh and effective command, their captain is Mingo Tamarind. Today, the name Mingo is used, is used as for somebody who betrays you. For weeks, Africans hunt Africans as the Free Negro Corps wears down the rebels. In a grim irony, the Africans are taken down by their own. May 4th, 1734. One of the last rebel groups at large faces capture. 
with their last remaining muskets, they choose a time-honored passage to their homeland. It was ritual death. It was not done out of desperation, or out of depression. It was done out of dedication to these principles and in, in the certain knowledge that their life would not have been in vain and that their spirits would rest in the homeland. The rebels shoot themselves. Among the fallen, the slave woman Brefl and King Ju. The bodies are discovered by French commander Longueville, who continues his manhunt with a vengeance. Before he leaves the island in late spring, the slaves he captures alive are burned at the stake, impaled, or cut into pieces. But Prince Akashi and a few remaining rebels evade capture. Under a promise of amnesty from the governor, they surrender in August. Taken to the Adrian plantation, they are double-crossed. Parada! Jolobetal for this! At the gate at Adrian, we are told, was maybe the greatest act of treachery in terms of a warfare that took place in all of this. Prince Akashi is decapitated. His comrades will be taken to the town square and burned alive. The gruesome spectacle marks the end of the 10-month upheaval on St. John. Slavery is not abolished in the Danish West Indies until a century later. For David Knight, the rebel story is far from over. A new chapter begins with the chance discovery of an abandoned plantation site, undisturbed since 1733. We have determined that this site was burned in the slave rebellion. Got it. Ken Wilde yeah. maps the ruins for the National Park Service as a potential dig site in the future. The discovery of a molasses skimming device is a tip-off that the team has found a lost sugarcane plantation. That's your homemade tool. Yeah. As the archaeologists unearth St. John's past, islanders celebrate the birth of the rebellion with an annual trek to the original fort. We give reverence to the dawn of the day, the sunrise. We give reverence to the sunset and reverence to the Mother Earth. Rather than considering the events of 1733 just history, the islanders are coming to see the slave revolt as an expression of the human spirit that continues to have relevance today. These men and women uh, lit a spark not just for themselves. They lit a spark that caught fire throughout this Caribbean. You couldn't get freedom out of their minds. They wanted to be free. The legacy left by this moment in time grows stronger as legends become real people and truth is liberated from folklore. What we see is a group who have completely overthrown a system. This was not a, a social cause. This was not a protest. This was a revolution. Even though it lasted only six months, the slave revolt of 1733 has earned its place in the history of the Caribbean. African slaves, armed only with intelligence and courage, created the first black state in the Americas and left behind a source of strength for the islanders of St. John. For us, they're freedom fighters because their, their spirit still continues to fight for freedom in our time.